Genesis chapter 12. If you have your Bible, Genesis chapter 12, and just follow me. I'm going to begin in the 10th verse. And the scripture reads, Therefore it shall come to pass that when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, this is his wife. Let me give you a little bit of context. Sarah, Sarai at this point, and Abram are leaving the only home that they had ever known and because there is a famine in the land. And they are leaving there, and he knows that as they head into Egypt, that because Sarah or Sarai is beautiful, that they will kill him just to take her and put her in the king's uh, harem. So he's saying to them, now if, if they ask you if you're my wife, what I want you to tell them is that, that, that you're my sister. Okay, let me read this again. All right, therefore shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save you alive. So say, I pray thee, that thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake. Woo, I'm not getting all this right here. It's got to be well with you. It's got to be well for your sake. But what about Sarah's sake? He said, if you say it, then my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The, the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house and he entered Abram, uh, I'm sorry, and he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he uh, uh, and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels and the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai Abram's wife and Pharaoh called Abram and said what is this that thou hast done unto me why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife why saidest thou she is my sister, so that I might have taken her to me. To, I might have taken her. I didn't even touch her. But just because I almost touched her, I got plagues breaking out everywhere. Now, therefore, behold thy wife. Get with your wife and get out of here. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So he ended up getting all of those animals and all of those, those the, 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 the she asses and the things that he got. He ended up getting them anyway. So he's leaving the, the country richer than he was when he got there, even though he lied. And we'll understand it better by and by. And 13 and one, and Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot went with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at first. And there Abram called yes, yes, yes. on the name of the Lord. Notice he's not calling on the name of the Lord when he's in Egypt. He doesn't even have an altar when he's in Egypt. And all hell is breaking out. But when he finally gets out of there alive, what does he do? He starts retracing his steps and says, I got to get back to that place because I can't live apart from that place. Look at your neighbor and say, retrace to the place of the altar. Say it again, retrace to the place of the altar. 
See, it was his memory. His memory became the means by which he was able to find God once again. His memory. See, if you have a memory, I'm telling you, if you can just remember the goodness of Jesus and, and what he has done in your, your memory will help you find the place of the altar. Spirit of God, I thank you. I ask you to just come into this room. Help us. We want to position our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. We want to hear what you're saying to the church. Help us, oh God, to be ready. Help us, oh God, to be prepared. Help us, oh God, to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Bless today in this house. We'll give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. On your way down, touch somebody and tell them retrace to the place of the altar. I want to give a big shout out to all of the people that served last Sunday. We had an amazing Easter service. I want to say thank you to all of you because we could not have done that without you. Especially to the parking lot team for getting everybody on and off the property. That, that was excellent and I, I am grateful for all of you who have served. After the fall of Adam and Eve and after the floods of Noah's day, God erected a plan, God established a plan to redeem the entire world. Yeah. His choice to lead the people toward that redemptive plan was a man that we know his name is Abram. We just read about him today. We know him actually by the name Abraham, but he was born Abram. And at a very critical point in his life, and in his life story, God changed his name. And for the first 99 years of his 175 years that he lived on the earth, he answered to the name of Abram. Abram was just an ordinary member of society. He was no different from those that, that were his neighbors or his family. As a matter of fact, like his relatives and like his neighbors, he worshiped idols. He was into idolatry. Yes, this is Abraham. He worshiped idols and he accepted mythology as truth. And yet it was to Abram, this sinful, superstitious idol worshiper, that God appeared. And God said to him, leave your country, leave your kindred, leave your father's house, and go to the land that I will show thee. And he made promises to him in Genesis 12 of the things that he was going to do in his life. And because you and I are the seed of Abraham, those promises that are in Genesis 12, they belong to us as well. Yeah. So it would do us all good to just read that every now and then so that we would know the blessings of Abraham that God has appropriated for all of us. He made him promises like he said, I will make you a great nation. Yeah. Now, never mind that he never even had a son at that point, but God said, see if I won't bring a nation out of you. He then goes on and he says, and I will bless you. I will not only bless you, but I will bless you to be a blessing. So I am going to bless you so much that you will have to be a blessing to somebody else. And then he goes on and he says, and I will bless those who decide to bless you. Yeah. And he, get, he goes on again and he said, and I will curse those who try to curse you. For through you, all who, through Abraham, the idolater, through Abraham, the moon, the sun worshiper, through, through Abraham, God said, shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. Why Abram? 
Why did God pick him? Look at somebody and tell them it was just grace. <laughs> it was just grace, the grace of God. He did nothing to earn it. He did nothing to deserve it. And only heaven knows why that God chose Abraham. God simply wanted to use him and he appeared to him. He was chosen out of the crowd by God. He, and, and because he was chosen by God, he believed God. And as a result of the relationship that he and God had together, he became someone whom God, to whom God would reveal his secrets. God had secrets and he would reveal those, not to everybody, but he would reveal them to Abraham. So he, would, he became, Abraham became somebody that God himself would in turn turn around and say, he's not just Abram, he's not just Abraham, he is my friend. I am the friend of Abraham. Okay, and, and, and he, he was actually one of the first great intercessors of the Bible. His prayer, how many are in here who know what I talk, I'm talking about when I say intercessors? Yeah, you know that God has called you to intercede. You know that your prayers make a difference. You know that when you pray, you climb in between destruction and calamity and you hold things at bay. It's, it's intercession. Uh, he was one of the first ones of the, Bi of the Bible. And it, it, because of his prayer life, it enabled him to know God. People that pray know God in a great way. He, it, it, it enabled him to know God. And knowing God is what gave him the faith to step out and to believe God. Abraham was a man that had a lot of great promises. He, but he also had a lot of great convictions and he had a, a lot of great principles that he lived by in his life. He was also a man that was very wealthy and yet his hope was never in the promises. His hope was in the promiser. Now, here's what I want you to understand today, that if it, I, I know that a lot of people fall in love with the promise, but they fail to develop the relationship with the promiser. And the promiser is so much greater than the promise that if you're going to grab hold of anything that I just said, just let go of the promise and grab the promiser. Because if you get him, you get it all. I said, if you get him, you will get it all. And he also said that if you will keep your mind stayed on me, that I will keep you in perfect peace. Abraham was greatly blessed by God, but he taught us as long as we cling to things that are material, that we will never really embrace the reality of the promises that God has made to us. Uh, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil, okay? So it doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money. And I'm telling you, if you can get to the place where you don't love money, money will flow in your direction. <laughs> Hear me. I'm not saying I don't appreciate it. I appreciate it. I need it. It answers all things. But at the end of the day, I don't love money. I just love what I'm able to do with the money that God gives me. And I've told him, if you bless me with money, I'll make sure that there is not a need around me that I don't try to reach out and fix. Yeah. Oh, it's quiet. Maybe I should talk about that. <laughs> love. I don't love money. I appreciate it, but I don't love it because I know the God who knows how to give it to me any time that I have need of. So Abraham understood that principle and he understood that if you're going to be blessed, go after the blesser, not after the blessing. Abraham could have never 
become Abraham. He could have never have become uh, the father of, of faith. He could have never become God's man of faith if he had stayed where he was, which was in the Ur of Chaldees, because Ur was full of idolatry. Had he stayed in the Ur of Chaldees, it would have seriously affected the outcome of his life. Therefore, though it was home to him, and though it was a comfort zone to him, he had to lay all of it on the altar, and he had to step away from it in order to make an advancement in the kingdom of God. Because every step of real advancement will always involve an altar on which you have laid some very dear, fragmented, broken pieces of your life. If you don't lay, if you don't have nothing laying on the altar, then you have no reason to advance. Abram loved God. He served him. He believed him. He consecrated himself to God. He was a great husband. He was a great friend. But one of the first and foremost things that made him great was not how he dressed, what he rode, what he had, but it was the fact that he built an altar unto God. Yeah. What is an altar? I know some of you know this, but just in case there's one or two that don't know it, an altar is not just the edge of the pulpit. Yeah. Come on. Right? An altar is, is a place where sacrifices are made unto God. It's the place where change occurs. Has there any, been anybody that has come to the edge of the stage and you prayed and change occurred in your life? Anybody? Right. So you know what that, you know what that means? That means this went from the edge of the stage into being an altar because change happens at the altar. Change is where you reach out and you touch the almighty God. Change is where you humble yourself. And that's important because I don't care how tall you are. Everybody has to look up to see him. I said everybody has to look up to see him. An altar is a place that you have set aside exclusively for your communion with God. If you never own a home, if you never drive a brand new car, if you don't wear designer clothes, if you don't have jewelry or you don't have art hanging on the wall of your house, it is imperative that you do have an altar. If you never have a friend, if you never have a confidant, if you never have a child or a spouse, or if you never have somebody that you can pour your heart out to. It is imperative that you have an altar. Every believer, how many believers are in this room? Every believer has got to have an altar. Every, every believer must have a place that they have marked off. I'm not just talking about this right here, but every believer has got to have a place where they have marked off and said this, this right here, this is my altar. You have to have an altar in your house. Maybe it's your closet. Maybe it's, maybe it's somewhere you go on your job. Wherever it is, you got to have an altar. An altar is a place where you separate and you isolate yourself. An altar is a place where you shut yourself in and you shut the world out. There also has to be an altar within you, the vessel. There has to be a part of your life that you designate this part right here belongs to God. It belongs to him in good times. It belongs to him in bad times. It belongs when I understand him. It belongs to him when I don't understand him. I'm, I, I'm not talking about a physical place right now. I'm talking about a place within your heart. You say that belongs to God. That's why you can never bankrupt me completely emotionally because I do have a place I can go. I said 
God. That's why you can't give your whole heart to anybody. I said you can't give your whole heart to anybody. There has to be a part in your heart where you say this belongs to God and you can try to bankrupt me. You can talk to me like I'm a dog, but when it is all said and done at the end of the day, I will go to my altar and I will find restoration for my soul. The altar is a place that is completely off limits to everybody that is in your life. It's where you let nobody but God come on the inside. It's where you also lay the knife to fleshly attachments. Can we talk about that for just a minute? It is a place where you go in and you say, God, I don't want to come out until this has been cut out of my life. I want it cut out once and for all because no matter how bad I want it for me I know it's not your will for me so I'm laying this down on the altar and I'm asking you to cut this out and I'm asking you to cut that out an altar is the part of you that you make no apologies for and no explanations about and you defend it with all that you have you defend that place in your heart. And let me set the record straight that some, some of us right now, you got, you got to be careful about that part of your heart. But I'll tell you about me. I don't care how close you get to me. It doesn't matter. You might think you are so close, but I'm going to tell you what you will never get. You will never get my altar. Because if you get my altar, you got me. And I need more than you. And I need more than you. What I need only God can give to me. So let me tell you, be careful who you are giving little pieces of, of your heart to. Because there'll be a moment that you'll find out that you are empty. You gave it all away and you are empty. I'm not saying you can't love people. I'm not saying that you can't uh, uh, let people into your heart and into your life. But there has got to be that inner sanctuary. I said that inner sanctuary that says that is reserved for God alone. He has reserved seating in my heart. He has reserved seating in my heart. Every one of us should have a place that is marked exclusively for him. You don't let your spouse into that place. You don't let your kids into that place. You don't let mom and them into that place. You don't let your friends in. You don't even let worry get in to that inner sanctuary. Don't let your bills get in there. Don't let your boo get in there. None of nothing can occupy that place that is reserved for God alone. Why? Because it is in that place that God restores and God renews and God preserves and God stabilizes you. But he ain't going to do it as long as you got other things in that spot. No idolatry can go into that spot. I am who I am because of the place. I am who I am because of my altar. I am who I am because I have, he has reserved seating in my life. And if I give it up, then I can't be the woman I need to be. You can't be the man you need to be or the friend or the mother or the leader or the pastor or the preacher that you need to be if you give up his seat to somebody lesser. Why is that such a big deal? Well, I'm glad you ask. Because if I lose my altar, then I lose my convictions. And then 
And I lose my consecration. I lose my standards. My standards go down. Have you ever noticed when you stop praying, the thing that you look at and you say is cute? Six months ago, when you were in the throes of prayer, you wouldn't have given that the time of day. But now you say it's cute because your standards. Yeah. Desperate people do desperate things. If I lose my altar, I lose my conscience. Okay. I... And then if I do all of that, then I become somebody completely different. Losing my altar could mean that you would not even recognize me anymore or that you wouldn't like me anymore. Abram had an altar and having an altar was important. If you go back through the scripture, you will see that great men of old have had altars. Isaac had an altar. Moses had an altar. Joshua had Gideon had an altar. Saul even had an altar. David had an altar. Paul had an altar. Uh, Samuel had an altar. And Elijah had an altar. Let me tell you who else had an altar. Noah. Noah was a man that had an altar. And when the rain, and, and let me tell you something, when the rain stopped coming down and when the flooding subsided, the first thing that Noah built was not a house. He didn't say, whoo, I'm going to come out of here and build a ministry. I'm going to build a business. I'm going to build a church. I'm going to build a database. I'm going to build a website. I'm going to get on TikTok and build myself up a following. Absolutely not. The first thing that Noah built when he came out of the ark, he built an altar. And on that altar, he offered sacrifices and praise and thanksgiving to the God that brought him through that storm that wiped every other person out, that wiped the entire earth out. Only thing left was him and his family. He said, before I do anything to regroup, I am going to build an altar and tell God, thank you for the storms that he's brought me through. Is there anybody in here that has a place where you can tell God thank you thank you that's what an altar is the altar is where you say thank you God it's where you wrestle down your flesh your flesh is going to want to go to the right and your spirit is saying no go to the left and so there is a war within your members what do you do call my friend no you call on Jesus you go to your altar and say God my desire is going one way but my spirit is pulling me another way and right now I need my soul to turn in the direction unto the altar Oh Lord, do I lift up my soul, my will, my mind, my intellect, my emotions. I, I, it turns at the place of the altar. The altar is where I learn to cope. It's where I learn to find hope. It's where my heart learns that it can keep on going on. The altar is where God increases and Cheryl decreases. God, what are you saying? I'm saying that God meets us at the altar look at somebody and tell him if you don't have an altar you don't have a meeting place God meets us at the altar at the altar he gives answers at the altar things that you've been worrying about things that you've been stretching stressing out about if you take it to the Lord in prayer he gives answers at the altar he gives direction at the altar he gives counsel I wish I was in a church that prayed because y'all could be saying amen right there he gives strategies at, has God ever given you a way out at the altar when my heart is overwhelmed I don't run to people the first place I run to is the altar why because he said call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you 
Abraham had an altar. He was, he was a man that had faith. He had an assignment that God had given him. And he did really good until he went to Egypt. It doesn't say he went into Egypt. But if you read that, you know, I tell y'all to read your Bible word by word because if you don't read it word by word, you'll miss very important things. But that verse says that he went down. Clue. That's a clue. Okay. He started a spiral roll downward when he went into Egypt. Going down into Egypt would be pretty much the equivalent of us aligning ourselves with the world. Aligning ourselves with the world system. It would be us depending on the arm of the flesh. And Isaiah said, woe be unto them that go down into Egypt for help. Don't go looking to the world to help you. If you want to take help to the world, take it. But don't go down to the world looking for help. That's what Isaiah said. Now, I, I understand that, 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 that Abram was in a famine. I understand that Sarah was with him, and I get that. But I will say this, he would have been much better off in where he was in a famine with God than going down into Egypt where there was plenty, but you didn't have God. At that point, you would have thought that the man of faith would have just thrown the responsibility back on God and say, God, you're the one that brought me here. You are the reason that I am here. I will trust that you will meet every need that is in my, so I'm going to stay right here until I clearly know the way that you would choose for me to go. And rather than trying to see the feminine, are trying to see uh, uh, God through the famine, he should have just stayed right there. And God would have met him because his name is Jehovah Jireh. Yeah. Whatever you're in, his name is still. Whatever you're Wherever you are, his name is still Jehovah Jireh. What does that mean? That means he is my provider. I'm in a fight, but he's with me. I'm in a storm, but he's with me. I lost my job, but he is in it with me. And he will provide. Abram was God's friend and he was a man of faith. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of character. But he went down into Egypt and he found himself being sucked into a lower system. He was sucked into paganism. He was sucked into evil. He was sucked into, I, I was, into everything that you could imagine. God's friend. I'm talking about God's friend. If that can happen to God's friend, don't tell me that it can't happen to you. He found himself overwhelmed. And now the man of faith, this man of faith starts acting like a man of fear. Who is the woman that is with you, Abe? Oh, oh her. She, that's my sister. Her name is Sarah. Sarah, meet them. Sarah's my sister. But he lied. I know technically she was his half-sister. But when he said it, he meant it to be a lie. Because the motive behind what he said was, I want you to do this for me, Sarah, because if you don't, they might kill me, and I need it to be well with me. Never mind what they're going to do with you, but I need it to be well with me. So there was an element of truth, but he meant for it to be a lie. 
And now because of what he is facing in his life, because he is in Egypt, now this man of God, this man that's filled with faith, he begins lying. Quiet. Why would Abram lie? Because one sin is never enough. One sin leads to another sin that leads, oh, it's quiet, because you don't want me to preach about sin. You're in the wrong church, because I'll preach about sin. Oh, yes, you can't shout about the blood and not preach about sin. Come on, y'all. What do I need the blood for if I don't sin? But we need the blood. So now he is not, he's not just, he's not just stepped outside of the grace of God, but he is also a liar. God's friend is a liar. When Abram lost his altar, he lost his faith. He went down into Egypt, and in Egypt he lost his courage, and now he's become a liar. Whew. You'd be surprised to know how many people will lie in the name of Jesus. They lie for all kinds of reasons. They lie to be accepted. I want to be accepted, so I will lie because I know this will get me accepted. They lie to feel like they fit in with the crowd. They'll tell you about friends that they do not have because they want you to be friends with them. They'll tell you about money that they did not make. They'll tell you about accomplishments that they did not accomplish. Pastors will tell you about members that they do not have. And they'll compromise their standards. Liars will compromise their principles. They will compromise their character just to be accepted. Compromise runs all the way through the life of Abraham. Now, Abraham was terrified for his own well-being. So in a cowardly kind of indefensible act, now he endangers Sarah. Hope you feel okay. Hope you're happy about that, friend of God. He exposed her to all kinds of issues. He exposed her to danger. He exposed her to rape. He, he became selfish. And he became full of fear. He was the man of faith. He was the man of promise. And had he been doing so great, he would not have went down into Egypt. But when you go down into Egypt, you mess up everything. Look at somebody and tell them you mess it all up. He was on his way to the promised land. He was on his way to the promises of God. So he never should have ever went down into Egypt. Why? Because there are just some places you don't go. Why would I go down into Egypt when the promised land is an option in my life? There are just some things that you don't touch. There are some things that you don't do. When you have been marked as a child of God, it does not matter who you are. I don't care who you are or what your title might be. You better recognize that your first title is human. I said your first title is human. And you have, look at somebody, tell them you better recognize. And so because you are human, you have to have boundaries. Well, I'm anointed. Well, all the more reason. Anointed people need boundaries. 
Hello, I said anointed people need boundaries. That means you can't, because of who you are, it means you can't stick your ear into everybody's conversation. You can't go into every open door. Hello, you can't answer every, first of all, don't give everybody your phone number. But if you do, you can't answer every call. That's why you have caller ID. Identify it. Quit acting like I ain't talking to you. You know good and well I'm talking to you. You act like, oh, she ain't talking to me, praise the Lord. I'm talking to every last one of us in this place. It is time out for us being phony. It is so time out for all of that. Temptation is coming to every, every woman and every man. Sometimes we need to stop churching and shouting long enough and stop trying to impress people long enough for us to say, I need to identify what is tempting me. My issue is not your issue. Your issue is not my issue. But I'm going to tell you something. We are all God's children. Got an issue. And if we don't identify them, they will become huge distractions. I said, if we don't identify them, they will become huge distractions. And other people, they may, may be able to handle it, but it's too much for you. Look, I can't tell everybody this because I can't see in everybody's eyes, but if y'all will let the Lord use you right now, look at somebody in their eyes and tell them it's too much for you. So what do you do? You keep walking. You keep staying focused. You don't pass go. You don't collect $200. Because you have some Delilah distractions. Yeah, you have Delilah distractions. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about Delilah or a woman, okay? I'm talking about you have a distraction like Samson did, whose name was Delilah. And when you know that, you say, I can't afford to play with that. Because I know that's, that's a problem for me. So I got to turn that off. I can't be doing that. I can't give myself to that. If I keep laying my head in the lap of my distractions, I'm going to lose my hair. I'm going to lose my strength. I'm going to lose my life. And I'm going to keep on tripping over these same things. These are areas of issues. You have to identify them. You have to admit them. And you have to stay away. Write that down. I got to identify. I got to admit. And I've got to stay away. And, and another thing, I don't care who tells you that it's okay. For you, it is not okay. Well, I just want to win them to Jesus. I just feel like I could win them. Stop it. It's not time for you to do that right now. And I don't care who all can do it. You cannot do it. Where you are concerned, it is not okay. It is not all right. Be careful who you talk to when you go down into Egypt. Oh, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. Why? Because it could set you back. It could send you through a relapse. It could make you relapse and fall back into what you have worked so hard to get out of. I don't care who all can. I care that you can't. And now you got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And until you get some things worked out, Stay away. Because you ain't strong enough yet. And a man that don't know his own fool, uh, his own limitations, is a fool. Look at somebody and tell him, don't be a fool. Sin is expensive. It 
it will nickel and dime you until it hits you what you just paid to be in the full throes of sin. It's expensive. It'll cost you your stuff. It'll cost you you. It'll cost you your joy. It will cost you your peace. It'll cost you your freedom. It will cost you the influence that you worked hard to get. Abram went down into Egypt and he compromised his wife's safety. And the minute he did it, he, he thought, oh, God, why did I just do that? You ain't got to say nothing, but if there's a root of God, anything in you, the minute you do it, oh, God, why did I do that? Come on, anybody will admit that to me? Oh, God. Why? Why? That was so stupid. That was so crazy. I know better than to do stupid stuff like that. What was I thinking? You of all people, God's friend. How did you get involved in that? Why are you in that apartment? Why are you in that house? Why are you watching those movies? Why are you looking at that magazine or that website? Why are you listening to that music? Because music has power. I said music has power. And if you ain't careful, it'll break you down. Why are you watching that? Abram went down nearly died in Egypt. And his wife was almost raped. Because when you go down in Egypt, when you go down into sin, when you go down in your standards, you don't just jeopardize yourself. You jeopardize everybody. Everybody that is around you, you jeopardize your family, you jeopardize your reputation, you jeopardize your ministry, you jeopardize your name, you jeopardize your focus. You see, when you go down into Egypt, things that you used to have under control, you pray to get them under control. You had them lay hands on you to get them under control. But now the thing that was under your control is out of control again because you went down into Egypt. And once you allow yourself to become desensitized, little by little, once you allow yourself to become lazy in your prayer life, once you allow yourself to back off out of your Bible, You allow yourself to stay home a couple Sundays. You allow yourself, oh, I just let down my guard just a little bit. Yeah. Once you let down your standard, can I tell you, flesh increases in Egypt. I said flesh increases in Egypt. Flesh will rob you from the promises of God. Flesh will start flexing every muscle it has when it is down in Egypt. It's frightening because you've given it an inch. But what did it do? It took a mile. And now it's embarrassing. Because stuff that you used to have the victory over now once again has the victory over you. It has the power over you. Stuff that you used to have under your feet, now it's on top of your head. Stuff that you reckoned as dead. Oh God, it's alive and it's well. And you don't want to tell anybody that you're losing ground. But that's exactly what is happening. It's 
embarrassing because so many people respected you. So many people used to look to you, ma'am. So many people are challenged by you, sir. So many people are impressed with you. So many people have put their confidence in you. And the reason they did it was because you had an altar. You used to be an intercessor. You used to be a prayer warrior. You used to have power in your prayer life. You used to would get in your car and not put it in reverse until you said, Father, give your angels charge over us and keep us and let no hurt, no harm, no danger come nigh our dwelling. Now we get in it and ride all over town, never acknowledging the Lord in our way. People that used to look to you, people that believed in you, people that relied on you, people that had faith in you. How do you tell them that you went down into Egypt? How do you tell them that you lost your prayer life? How do you tell them that you're no longer have an altar? How do you tell them? And to be honest, once you have known the real power of prayer, it's hard to not have it. Once you've known the real anointing of God, once you've had a real walk with God and a real communion with God and a real relationship with God, you now know the difference. Some of of y'all, the worst thing you could have ever done was come into this church. Because now you know the difference between singing a song and tapping into worship. Tell somebody, I'm ruined, I'm ruined. I can't go back to where I used to go. I cannot endure what I used to endure. I cannot call me a troublemaker. Call me whatever you want. But I am torn now because I can't go back to that. Abram went down into Egypt. Going down caused him to pick up a couple things that he should have never picked up because it was in Egypt, he, they brought her out, but it was in Egypt that he met this lady by the name of Hagar. Yeah. So he picked up a relationship that was never the will of God for his life. Y'all don't have to act like you know what that's like. He picked up a soul tie that he should have never been tied up with. He made the wrong decisions, the wrong choices. He made the wrong connections. He connected with somebody who pulled an Ishmael out of him. Y'all know what Ishmael's name is? His name is a wild Ass. The friend of God hooked up in a relationship with somebody who pulled that out of him. Yes, he slept with the bound, and as a result, he became bound himself because you will never lay down with less and ever get up with more. Never, never. Let me say it like this. If you lay down with dogs, you're going to get up with fleas. He would have never met her had he not went down. Look at somebody and tell him, Hagar's waiting on you in Egypt. She distracted him. She broke his focus. She got him off course and she set him back. 
she almost destroyed his marriage, his ministry, and his life. If he wouldn't have stayed out of Egypt, he'd have never met her. He'd have never messed up with her. Look at somebody and tell them, stay out of Egypt. Tell them again, stay out of Egypt. Somebody's contemplating on stepping over into Egypt right now. But look at him and tell him, you better keep yourself out of Egypt. You're going to jeopardize everything. You'll jeopardize your future. You're going to jeopardize your family. You're going to jeopardize your destiny. You're going to jeopardize the assignment of God in your life. He jeopardized his wife. And he has no idea at this moment that endangering Sarah meant he was endangering the promise of God. She was beautiful. But had it not been for a God who sees everything and knows everything, she would have been raped. Look at how his whole family is now at risk. Why? Because he lost his altar. Because he lost his prayer life. Because he lost his boundaries. He has compromised her safety. Why? Because he disregarded all the flashing lights. He disregarded the warning signs. He disregarded the very thing that was there to protect him. Now he has went over the edge. And this is what I want you to know. Sin doesn't only affect you. It affects everything attached to you. So if you don't want to get right for yourself, do it for them. Do it for your son. Do it for your daughter. But whatever you do, tell somebody, stay out of Egypt. Egypt. Abram has lost his altar. When you lose your altar, you set your whole family up for destruction. Because they will become exposed to things that they would have never been exposed to. They're exposed to sin. They're exposed to danger. They're exposed now to disease. They're exposed to hate. They're exposed to evil. They're exposed to crime. They're exposed to destruction. All because somebody that they were riding with jumped the guardrail and lost their altar. Abraham, when he wouldn't speak up for Sarah, She still had a man in her life that said, I got you. And God told Pharaoh in so many ways, sent plagues, all kinds of plagues into Egypt. He said, listen, my friend Abe, he ain't told you the truth. That's not his sister. That's his wife. And you better not touch her. Don't put your hand on that woman right there. Because see, Sarah is a praying woman. And if you touch Sarah, if you start messing with somebody that has a prayer life, if you take advantage of this woman right here, I will turn this entire city upside down. Church, you better be careful who you go to grabbing for, who you go to reaching for, who you go to laying hands on, 
who you go to striking out against because that's probably why some of y'all are in debt right now and out of money. You're in debt, but you're out of money because God can't bless you because you're grabbing things that you have no business grabbing. When you lose your hold, you lose your convictions. And you start touching whatever you want. I'll touch whatever I want to touch. I'll do whatever I want to do. Uh, you thought you could do it and get by with it. Look at God. He brought you to church today and brought me to church today and he said, preach on it. You thought you were the king of your kingdom. You thought you were, I'm not, and, and let me tell you something, I'm not just talking about men, I'm talking about women in this place too. You thought you were the queen of your castle. You thought you were the king of your game, but even kings are held accountable. God said, I am the king of kings, and I am the Lord of lords, and sin when it is what look at somebody and tell them it might not be finished yet that's why you okay but sin when it is finished it brings forth death look at somebody and tell them finish it before it finishes you if you touch that woman, I'll shut you down. I'll curse everything that you put your hands on, Mr. Pharaoh. And it might not happen all at once. But little by little, piece by piece, like Samson, you'll jump up to do what you have always done, except now you have no anointing to do it. And because you refuse to break up with your Delilah distractions, Delilah will break you. You see, as long as Samson remained consecrated, as long as he remained awake, as long as he remained aware, as long as he remained on the altar, he was unconquerable. You couldn't conquer him. He was a strong man, but he was deceived by his own strength yeah. because even strong people harbor hidden weaknesses. The secret of his strength was his hair. The secret of his strength was his consecration. The secret of his strength was the fact that he had an altar. But when he lost his order, he lost his consecration. When he lost his consecration, he lost his hair. When he lost his hair, he lost his strength. And when he lost his strength, they gouged out his eyes. So they took his vision. They didn't take his vision at first. He lost his altar first. Little by little and lock by lock, now he has no altar. He has no consecration. He has no hair. He has no strength. Now he has no vision. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. He was strong. And he thought he was okay. He thought he was in control. He thought he was doing fine. He thought he was one step ahead of it all. He thought he was standing, but let him that stand it. Take heed lest he. Samson lost his altar. Abram lost his altar. And had it not been for a God who knows all, sees all, and speaks up for his own, he would have lost his wife to the hands of an abusive king. All because he lost his. God spoke up for Sarah. The king said to Abe, 
when he heard and he found out that Abe was really her husband, the king said, you lied to me. That is not your sister. That is your wife. Man, get her and get out of my face. I just almost touched her. And I've got plagues on the right and on the left. I've got diseases. i got people dying. Get her and get out of here now. Because when a man loses his altar, that used to have an altar, not only is he the one that gets judged, but everybody that's playing with him gets judged too. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And those who served his lust were punished with his plague. Partners in sin, partners in punishment. Get her out of here. Now, Abe lost his courage. When he lost his courage, he lost his faith. When he lost his faith, he traced it all back to the fact that he was in Egypt and he no longer had an altar. His only recourse was I need to retrace my steps. And he reached out for Sarah's hand. He said, Sarah, I'm so sorry. But I promise you, I got us into this, but I'm going to get us out of there. I messed it all up. You could have been hurt, but I'm going to get us out of here. We're coming out of this place. I'm, I'm coming out. You're coming out. I failed you. Let me just say it. I failed you. I'm not going to try to shift any blame. I failed you. I let my standards down. But we're coming out of it. I failed God, but we're coming out of it. I fooled around too long. But I've I've reached one, two, many times. But we're coming out. I delayed our blessing. I compromised your life. But we're coming out of it. I did stuff I'm ashamed of. But I'm so sorry. And we're coming out. I hooked up with the wrong people. But we're coming out of this. I let the wrong people hook up with me. But baby, we're coming out. I want you to just pull on somebody next to you and tell them we're coming out. Come in. Do you understand this? Come in. It's not an event. It's a journey. I'm coming. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm coming out. My feet are headed in the right direction. I'm coming out of it. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. It may take you a minute, but you can come out of it. Trust will have to be rebuilt, but you're coming out. I'm on my way back to the place that I had in God. I'm on my way back to the relationship that I had with God. I want my prayer life back.
back. I want my consecration back. I want to build my altar back. God has been too good to me for me to lose my altar. How? How could I forget what you've done for me? How can I forget how you set me free? How can I forget how you brought me? Jesus, I'll never forget. Nothing I got in Egypt is worth my altar. Nothing I got over there is worth what I get in my altar. Because I remember, I remember how you used to meet me. You would meet me at my altar. When I would kneel down, you were there. You would sit with me in the altar. You would pray through me. There would be times I would start praying, but then all of a sudden the Holy Ghost would take over. And now you were praying through me. You were praying the perfect will of the Father. Abram said, I remember that place and I'm not going to stop Sarah till I get back to that place. And Abram went back to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. Tell somebody my first love. I'm going back to my first love. I'm going back to the place of the altar. And when he got there, he called on the name of the Lord. He went back to his place of consecration, his place of communion with God. He went back to his altar. He went back to the scene, back to the scene where he first knew God. When you feel away and you feel lost and you feel like you don't know what to do, retrace your steps. This, this is where I, this is where I met him. This is where I knew him. This is where he told me I was somebody. This is where he met me. This is where he picked me up. This is where he wiped all of the mess off of my. It was right here at the altar. And I will work until I build it back again. How do I do that, Pastor Brady? You say things like, restore unto me. Yeah. The joy of thy salvation. Renew in me a right spirit. Create in me a clean heart. Cast me not away from your presence. Don't ever take your Holy Spirit. Don't Take your spirit from me. Cleanse me from my secret faults. But the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, I don't want to think about anything that is not acceptable in your sight. But when we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. God, I want my altar back. I want my place of communion. I want my place of fellowship. If I got to give up friends, I'll give them up. If I, if I got to give up connections, I'll give them up. If I got to be alone, I'll just be alone. That's okay. I just want my altar back. If I don't get the job, give me the altar. If I don't get the house, give me 
make the altar. If I don't have the title, I've got to have the altar because I can't be who I'm supposed to be without you. So I want, I want it back. And I'll worship my way back. I'll pray my way back. I'll serve my way back. I'll give my way back because I got to have my altar. I want my altar back. I want my prayer life back. I want my consecration back. I want my reputation back. I want my good credit back. I want my peace. And whatever it costs, I will pay it. No, do not put it on sale. I will pay the full price. I'll pay it because Sarah, I can't be your husband without an altar. Abram, I can't be your wife without an altar. My altar is where I get in touch with God. And not having an altar is like living in a house without a phone without a computer, without any of that, you just feel utterly disconnected.